Welcome everyone to our distinguished lecture series. My name is Jeff McDonald, uh, the uh, Associate Director of the Global Institute for Water Security, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this series. I want to uh, remind everyone that next week we have Manu Lal coming to us from Columbia University, and I uh, want to welcome our many viewers that are looking at this uh, in recorded form, our cohort of Masters of Water Security students, both in Saskatoon and at Beijing Normal University, and our Global Water Futures partners uh, nationwide. And we thank Global Water Futures and the Global Institute for Water Security for underwriting the series. I also want to acknowledge that we're coming to you from Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis, and our water resources program at University of Saskatchewan recognizes and respects these First Nations and uh, pledges to work with them to improve uh, water resources uh, throughout Canada uh, in the future. Um, it's my extreme pleasure to welcome Teresa Bloom with us today. Uh, Teresa is a group leader at the GFZ, German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam, and she's an international thought leader in experimental hydrology, catchment hydrology. She's also the editor-in-chief of Hydrology and Earth System Science, our top-rated hydrology journal. We've been very blessed at having multiple editors and chief in our chiefs in our seminar series this, this year, and we're very uh, thankful that Teresa could make time for us. Uh, she's uh, been awarded uh, many, many recognitions as part of her career. I would say technically she's in mid-career. Uh, she was a 2016 Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the University of Birmingham and has several early career awards, including one from the European Geophysical Union uh, Young Scientists Outstanding Poster and Presentation Award. Um, but really her leadership relates to some of the things she's done as editor of, of HESS, but also several things on the AGU front that I've most appreciated. Uh, she chaired the AGU Technical Committee on Catchment Hydrology. She's been a member of the AGU Award Committee for the Langbein Award. And it's just a, a real pleasure to have someone with us, uh, like Teresa, who's going to talk to us today about experimental hydrology. And I'll turn it over to you now, Teresa. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you for this introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, so I guess I'll just get started right away because uh, time is always short and I have a lot to talk about. So let me share my screen. Um, looks good. All right. So um, I will be talking about a very special topic, actually, because it's about field observations of hydrological flow path evolution, not just at one point in ten, but a time, but over 10 millennia. And as you can see from the author list, this is a project that involves quite a few people. Um, in my talk today, I will mostly be focusing on the results from Anna Hartmann, uh, my PhD student. So this talk is about runoff generation or hydrological processes. And um, because I'm not sure about your backgrounds here in the audience, I'm just gonna cover briefly some, some, some details on this or some background on this. So why do we need to know about runoff generation processes? Well, because they control the response of our river networks, not only uh, in general terms, but also to extreme events and extreme events are becoming more likely um, due to global change. So they control flood risk, water quality and water availability. And we need to understand them better to support sustainable landscape management. Management, because we can't just deal like use statistics on our current observations if, if the background or the if the if the um, boundary conditions are changing due to global change. We really need to understand these processes. So runoff generation process is actually such a basic topic in hydrology, but we still have so many open questions and I'm sure Jeff talks about these open questions a lot. Um, so one of some of these are how and when do hill slopes connect to the stream network? What controls water storage and release? How much control does vegetation have? But also how do we investigate subsurface processes? This, these processes are invisible to the eye. How do we measure and model preferential flow? How much do we need to know about subsurface structures? 
And then, of course, also, can we transfer local findings to other sites? This is super important because we can't just measure everywhere. And then also, we can't really measure um, these processes at, at, the, at the large scale, right? Not at the large catchment scale. So we need to find a way to infer processes to the larger scale. So we need systematic approaches to tackle these challenges. Um, hill slopes are units that make sense in terms of form and function in, in process hydrology. How do we study them? Well, there are a few intensively studied hill slopes like Panola, Mai Mai, Hubbard Brook, and so on. And then there we try to find processes and patterns that are generalizable. However, there's a challenge because uh, our hydrological processes are controlled by a multitude of, of potential variables that all interact. So you see here on the right, we have interactions between soil vegetation, hydrology, geomorphology, and others more. So I'm going to use the concept of form and function in hill slope hydrology as kind of, kind of a guidance um, in this process of understanding our processes. And the idea of form and function, this dualism was first established in architecture. So this was form follows function coined in 1896. It is a term also commonly used in biology um, here, for example, by Thompson already in 1942. It describes the link or the mutual influence, the co-evolution of appearance and functional purpose of an object. And so down here in this graph, you see how we can use this in hydrology. And this is something that Lisa Angermann, uh, one of my PhD students, uh, did and published in 2018. So on the one hand side, on the one on the left side, we have function which in hydrology would be the response dynamics, the response patterns. And then on the other side, we have form, which are flow relevant structures um, or things like structures, substrate changes and so on. So systematic studies of this link can help us to infer structures from response observations and vice versa. So this is helpful to understand processes, but also transfer these processes to other sites under data constraints. But again, we have to deal with this challenge of co-evolution and feedbacks. So co-evolution, I've mentioned this twice now, um, this has to do with landscape and evolution in general, because our landscapes have evolved over a long time and this evolution might actually help us or understanding this evolution better might actually help us to um, understand hydrological processes as well. So landscape evolution is commonly studied using models, quite theoretically actually. Um, so the input is the current understanding of su surface processes, the function, and the output is here, like as you see here on the right, is the form, the, the geomorphology of a, um, a certain terrain. Uh, this here is a study by Jean Brown, um, one of the um, section heads here at GFZ. And here is just a list of exam exam uh, some examples of um, landscape evolution models. And um, you see here in this first circle on the left that most of them cover really large areas. So they're not looking at um, processes at the hill slo slope scale. And then in the circle on the right, you see that they also do not really cover or they have gap in certain processes that are actually kind of important in landscape evolution, such as, such as weathering, stratigraphy, or maybe also groundwater. So there is a gap here. On the other hand, soil evolution has also been studied with models. And here um, it's modeling of the evolution of soil profiles. So again, um, we put in the current understanding of processes and we get an output, the form, um, which is the soil profile. And you see here these little um, icons that I used like um, for, the, for the form, uh, for the function, uh, these little cogwheels and the forms for the form. So you will find these throughout the talk. So another way of studying landscape evolution is for example, using the, um, the LEO, um, the Landscape Evolution Observatory, which is a really unique setup. 
uh, with a lot of sensors. So here we get both form and function, but we need to be really patient in observing this evolution. So what other options do we have if we want to know more, if we actually want to understand processes and not put in processes that we already think we understand? We can go with a way that's more for the impatient. If we don't want to wait and watch how things develop, we use place for time substitution or chrono sequences. So um, this has been used, for example, in land use change impact studies where um, site selection is based on the years since the disturbance or the change of land use. Um, but we can also use site, sites uh, selected based on the years since hill slope formation. Uh, this has also been done by other people, um, as you see in the reference here. And here, the output is both form and function. So we will use this approach, hill slope evolution in the field. Our test bed, in this case, are glacial moraines. The advantages here are that we have hill slopes of different ages in close proximity. So we use this place for time approach. And these glacial forefields thus provide unique opportunities to study the sorts of these sorts of processes. The challenges of these glacial forefields are that we have really short field seasons, right? Snow stays a long time and comes early. Um, I bet it's already snowing there now. It's a harsh environment, and it's, so it's really difficult for long-term monitoring of hydrological processes. This is. Um, an example of what, what, what our field site actually looks at. So indeed, it's a harsh environment. We studied this environment in an interdisciplinary study. So it involves scientists, um, soil scientists, geomorphologists, weathering experts, biologists, and hydrologists. So that's uh, why we have this large group of authors also on the title slide. Um, our chrono sequence in this at this site in the Swiss Alps looks like this. Um, you can see here at the upper edge of the photo the, the, the glacier, and you can see the, the, the arrow shows the progression of glacier retreat. So the glacier, uh, the moraines that you're, are shown here by these um, markers, have ages from between 30 years old to 10,000 years. And these are the sites where we will be studying. If we zoom in um, here now, we are looking at the more specific plots um, that we are looking at, uh, that we've studied at this site. And we've tried to differentiate them by vegetation complexity. So this does not only involve vegetation coverage, but also a lot of other variables um, that were um, evaluated by our geobotanists. And you can see that the low, the youngest moraine, which was um, uncovered only in 1990, has a lot sparser vegetation than the oldest one that's 10,000 years old. That's already obvious from these photos here. So at each moraine age, we have three plots that we've been studying now uh, of this different vegetation complexity. So yeah. As I said, we have this gradient, and here again, um, we're just comparing directly the two youngest hill slopes. And already here, you see the difference in vegetation. Our experimental design was, on the one hand, focused on rainfall experiments. So each plot had rainfall experiments where we had, um, where we captured subsurface and surface flow. We had several sprinklers and then put in uh, various sensors um, to monitor the um, soil moisture, groundwater dynamics, and so on. This is what constructing these rainfall plots looked like. Um, here you can see Ilya van Meerfeld um, on the left and my PhD student, Anna Hartmann, and then me there on the right, where we're digging in the soil, trying to uh, build these trenches at the lower ends of the plots. Um, then we needed a lot of water to irrigate them. And this was uh, collected in these basins here. This is actually water from the stream. And here on the, on the right-hand photo, you see Markus Weiler. I think he also presented in this lecture series. Um, so he's also part of this project. And then one of the plots as that was completely instrumented. 
So adjustable sprinklers for to have uh, irrigation at various intensities, uh, the trench to collect surface flow and subsurface flow, and then the plot boundaries to, to minimize boundary effects and loss of water to the sides. This is what one moraine looks like. And if you look closely, well, you can see our PhD students and you can also see the three plots uh, with the different um, vegetation complexity. This is the oldest moraine and you can see the water uh, basin at the top there. And now um, we will try to look at a short movie um, and please let me know if it is choppy on your side. Um, because then we're just going to stop this and you can have that link to look at the movie later. So I will now um, share the movie. So yeah, I can provide you with the YouTube link here um, in case you want to see it again or share it with other people. So as you already saw in the movie, there were some good days with, with good weather and everything worked perfectly. But of course, if you're familiar with being in the field, there were also bad days where fire hoses leaked or exploded, where we suddenly had sheep on our plots, uh, even though we had put up fences and various similar things more. So this is something all field work people are probably familiar with. So now we will move into the results and we will start with structural changes with age, looking at vegetation and then soil. So these are results from Konrad Greinwald, a PhD student from Freiburg University, and he looked at the vegetation. And here, um, time is running from right to left. Um, and you see that vegetation cover, which we already saw from our photos, uh, increases with age, which kind of makes sense. Also, root density uh, increases with age, um, which also seems kind of, yeah, obvious, but it's good to know that it's really happening. Um, he also looked at like different root ca characteristics, um, diameters, length, fine root density, and so on. I'm not going to get into that here. The soils, if you look at profiles, look like this. Um, here uh, we have the young moraines on the right, and then the oldest one, the 10,000 K um, on the left. And again, again even just by looking at them, they look quite different. And you can see um, how much more organic matter, for example, or, or at least we see darker uh, black horizon uh, at the 10,000 K moraine compared to the very youngest one. 
If we now look at this more in more detail, and this is uh, work by Anna Hartmann, my PhD student, which she published in ESSD. So this is a data paper, um, and you can actually also download all this data here, shown here. So we see now here, age is going from left to right, so, um, as it should be, um, 30 year old moraine on the left, uh, in the blue plots on the right hand side, and then 10,000 year on the right. And you see how porosity is increasing with age and at the same time bulk density is decreasing and this is strongest for the 10 centimeter depth so this seems to be starting at the surface and then moving further down if we look at uh, at the sand silt clay fractions shown on the left hand plot we see how especially like the silt fraction seems to be increasing quite a bit with age um, on the other hand um, there's less sand, um, the lightest bar here, um, as we go move on to the, the, um, the older moraines, the 3000 and the 10,000 year old moraines. So we see there are differences in these soil structural characteristics, bulk density decreases, porosity and silt constant, constant content increase with age. So these are um, structural changes, changes in form. We've also looked at soil water retention curves, and I'm not going to get into the detail what soil water retention curves actually are. I think probably some of you know, some might not know, but what you see here is that these curves of pressure per head, water content versus pressure head, they move towards the right side as with age. And this means that water retention actually increases with rate age. And this is uh, really important for water um, transport and water storage. Now, as I'm already talking, starting to talk about water transport, we're moving into the, the field of function. And here now I'm going to show a few results of, of surface and subsurface flow, soil moisture and groundwater event response, sediment transport, and then subsurface flow paths. And we'll mostly focus on these subsurface flow paths. So, here, just a brief, brief overview of the results of our irrigation experiments at these large plots. And you can see how these circles show, so each line of circles shows the three irrigation experiments that we carried out. The upper line shows surface runoff, the lower line of circles shows subsurface runoff. If the circle is colored, it means it occurred, this type of runoff occurred. If it's white, it means we did not observe flow at our trench. And you can see it was a bit disappointing. There are quite a lot of white circles, so no flow was observed. And you also don't really see a super clear trend or something that you know springs out at you that uh, with age, right? It's not like, we get a lot more flow with age or we get a lot more subsurface flow with age or maybe a little bit, but yeah, it's nothing clear. So um, we're still looking into that. And this is work mainly um, by, done by um, Ilya's student, Fabian Meyer. So we also, as I said, had these sensors installed at each plot uh, measuring soil moisture, pressure head and depth to groundwater. And this is just an example of what these time series look like. And here now circled on the right side of the timeline, you can see that our three irrigation experiments here in the red box actually did have an effect on, on at these, this plot, all of these um, variables. So there is a direct response. And then I'm just going to show you an overview of how soil moisture and its variability changes over time with age. And here again, you see, well, maybe not that much change in the, in the two youngest ones, um, but then there's a big leap um, towards the, for the oldest moraine where we actually have higher soil moisture content and also quite some variability. Uh, and this might be related to what I showed you in these soil moisture characteristic curves that we have more water storage um, now as the soil has aged. And now 
I'm going to get into another experiment run by Fabian Maya, Ilya's PhD student. I'm just going to show you this because it, it looks so cool. Um, so what he did was used glow in the dark sand and in different colors um, to uh, use for the diff three different rainfall intensities of the rainfall experiments. And then he took uh, pictures before and after the simulation and looked how far the particles moved um, with each intensity, um, which is an indicator for the connected flow pathways. And so if we look at this in more detail, we can see that there's um, more overland flow on the younger moraines. Um, there's higher surface connectivity and more sediment transport. So the vegetation that develops on these moraines as they age uh, reduces the sediment transport. And also what he found was that these observed patterns from these kind of tracer experiments also agreed well with the sediment loads observed in the, in the, in the um, trenches. So this is an interaction of structure or form and function. Now we're going to move on to subsurface flow paths. And these are especially challenging, as I already mentioned in the beginning, because we cannot observe them easily, right? They're not, it's not something we can really make a movie of. We can capture, try and capture at, at these trenches. But again, they, they're, if we get lateral subsurface flow, that's only yeah, one manifestation. There's a lot more going on that we just can't see. And what you see on, this, uh, on these photos here are subsurface flow paths um, highlighted by dye tracing. And so here, white, these are just shown as kind of binary image where white, uh, marks, white marks show the flow paths uh, the water has taken and the rest of the soil where water did not really move into. Um, this is again the result of irrigation um, that's shown in, in, in the dark color. And you can see that only in the lowermost uh, photo did we actually see an infiltration, a straight infiltration front. Um, both other um, images show preferential flow. And the uppermost one is shown is, is under uh, dry conditions, and then the middle one is under wetter conditions. So again, those flow paths change with the boundary conditions, with um, the status quo of the soil. So preferential flow or subsurface flow paths are extremely tricky. Well, they are tricky, but why are they important? Well, they are important because they affect water storage. They affect plant water availability nutrient transport, contaminant transport, and then of course runoff generation. So we can't just ignore them, even though most models actually use this really simple, yeah, conceptual uh, setup that's shown in the lowermost plot, right? Because it's really tricky also to model preferential flow. So how did we in investigate this here at the, in the Hillscape project? Again, we used a dye tracer, this time uh, it's brilliant blue dye, and Anne Hartmann and um, Katja, uh, a master's student, they did a bunch of irrigation experiments with brilliant blue dye, and then they excavated it afterwards, uh, the day after. They excavated soil profiles, uh, which is really hard work, uh, and then took photos and analyzed these images. So these plots, of course, they couldn't be on the big irrigation plots because that would disturb them or destroy them because this is destructive uh, yeah, sampling. Um, so they are just right next to them. And they um, follow the same design as the large rainfall experiments along the age and the vegetation complexity gradients. And in total, um, they did 36 dye tracer experiments, which is amazing. Um, and here you see um, photos of exemplary flow path um, observed at these three moraines. Um, and then you see how this is then processed, these types of photos. So there's a geometric correction. There's um, 
background subtraction, color adjustment, and then manual identification of stones and plants. And then you end up with images like the ones on the right that are binary, or in this case, we have a third uh, component, which is the red component, that's the rocks. Um, because yeah, there's not really much flow going on through rocks. And in these, in these alpine environments, there are a lot of rocks, which those poor women also suffered from when they dug up those profiles. So you can already see here that there seems to be some difference between these uh, flow paths and different age classes. And we can analyze this. I mean, we can look at these images and say, okay, it looks different, but then we can also become a bit more quantitative and we can look at flow path width. So what we do here is we go line by line, uh, pixel line, horizontal line in the images, and we identify or measure the flow path width. width. And this is what you see on this uh, figure here, where the dark blues are the wide flow path and the light blues are the narrow flow paths. Um, so the lighter, the narrow, the flow path. And then and you can see um, how these dyed or the, the stain um, amount or fraction of pixels decreases with depth here. Um, so on the y-axis, we have depth um, because of course it's not homogeneous. It doesn't just cover everything. And then we also added to this plot um, the rock widths that we observe because this is in this in as I said in this alpine environment quite important um, or it's a yeah a big component of our profile. So we also looked at the the rock size distribution basically. Okay, so this is an example here for for one of the experiments, um, and you can see that there's quite a few wide flow paths uh, uh, in the upper part of the profile. And then in the lower part of the profile, we only have the narrow profiles uh, or the more narrow and then a little fraction of the of the really narrow, so smaller than 20 millimeters, so narrower than 20 millimeters. Okay, but now Anna and Katja did a bunch of experiments and here they are um, differentiated, but you don't really have to look at all these details by complexity. Um, each line is an age. So we have here the 30 and the 160 year old moraine. Then we did different amounts of irrigation. So that's also shown here, but I just want to like have you give you this general impression of what this looks like. This is uh, the two younger moraines. And then we have here the two, old. these are the two. So each line is an age class again. Uh, and here you see the two youngest moraines. And then we move on to the older moraines and already you can see that there's a difference, right? Let's go back one, the two youngest moraines, and then here, the old, two older moraines. And there's a clear difference, but we can take this a step further and we can identify flow types. So these flow types include four different preferential more type flow paths, macro, micropore flow with low interaction, mixed macropore flow, so that's low and high interaction with the surrounding matrix. Um, then a mix of macropore flow with high interaction and finger flow, and then heterogeneous matrix flow and finger flow. So there's, I mean, it's a, all a bit of an overlap, but these are the four classes. And then there's homogeneous matrix flow. And so how we end up in these flow types is that we look again at our um, the images that I just showed or the, these plots that I just showed and then we look at uh, we identify the fraction of the these different stained path widths and so here in this example we have um, 10 percent um, of the the most narrow path widths when 10% of the next, the medium, and then we have 80% of the widest, so um, 20 to 100 uh, centimeters of path width. So, and this then gives us, we end up in this dark gray color, and dark gray means homogeneous matrix flow in this case. So we can do this for each of our experiments or each of our age classes, 
and then we end up with flow type distributions. And here again, you see flow type uh, distributions, how they change with moraine age. So 38 year old on the left and 10,000 year old on the right. And then the relative frequency of the occurrence of these flow types um, in all the experiments carried out at each moraine. And what you can see is that this dark blue color, the bar for it with the dark blue color, which is the homogeneous matrix flow, um, gets smaller and smaller with age. And on the other hand, the bar with the um, these lighter colors, um, which are preferential flow, and then especially the lightest, this light green, blue, whatever color that is, um, more greenish, I think, um, that's macropore flow, and that is highest at the 10,000 year old moraine. So there's definitely a, um, a trend of preferential flow increasing with age. And then Anna made this really nice figure where she tried to kind of summarize her findings. And I've actually edited out some because it's just getting too full. Um, and they're the trends with age. And you can see that we have this increase in organic matter um, and an increase in porosity with age. On the other hand, decrease in particle size and bulk density. And then here on these sketches, you see how the vegetation changes and how the characteristic dye patterns change. So um, at the oldest moraine, most of the dye is actually at the top, um, stored in this kind of organic layer. And then we have preferential flow, macropore flow, in this case, going to greater depth. Um, but most of the profile is unstained. So there's more detail here in the more major flow path controls um, that Anna listed, and you can look all of that up in her HES publication from 2020. But I think we will move on here and not get into all these details right now because there's more to come. Um, here I try to summarize um, how, what of the, uh, the factors we looked or variables we looked at concerning um, form and function, how they change with age. And so in the upper part, I summarize those that increase with, uh, with age, vegetation cover, root density, uh, the percentage of organic material, and the thickness of the organic layer, prosody, silt content, aggregate stability, pore complexity, and small, tops, uh, small pores at the top of the five, top five centimeters. So I did not show all of these results, um, but I just wanted to list them here. Um, also, hydrophobicity changed with age, which can also influence preferential flow. And then, as I said, water retention, water storage, micropore flow. Decreasing with age, we also saw a number of things. Um, for example, bulk density, uh, sand and gravel fractions, the large rocks larger than 20 centimeters, um, the surface connectivity, um, but also the infiltration depth matrix flow. Um, but then also, and this is also something I did not show, um, carbon weathering and um, um, export of calcium and magnesium. So this is just a little bit of an overview here at this stage. And then we also had the question, is it sufficient to make all this effort that we've shown here and we've done more than that um, once at a single location or do we need to look at other sites um, to really understand these sorts of processes? And our main question was at this point in time and you can of course ask many more is does geology matter in this context, right? Because we went in to one place with one geology um, so how much control does geology have over these sorts of evolutionary processes? And so what we did is then in year two, we went to a different glacial forefield. And in year one, all the results I've shown so far, it was in silicate parent material. So silicious rock as parent material. And now we're going um, into 
the Griesfian forefield, which has calcareous parent material. And again, we have four moraines, different ages, slightly different ones, because of course you can't, you know, go looking for the exact same ages everywhere, but we were quite lucky. It's quite similar, if not, I'm not perfect, but good enough, I think. So we're now comparing these two sites and their evolution. And this is what the second sites uh, looked like. So we are, we don't have a 30 year old moraine, just 110, then 160, 4,900 and 13,500 years old. Again, you already see again, how vegetation develops on these hill slopes. Again, soil physics, let's start with that, um, the, the form. And now you see the comparison of the siliceous parent material sites, which is shown in blues, and the calcareous parent material in green. Uh, again, the left side is the youngest and the right side is the oldest moraines. And then we also show the three different depths. Um, and so you've basically seen the blue boxes before, but now we also have the green ones from the calcareous parent material. And you see how here, um, we basically have a similar trend concerning bulk density. Um, maybe not quite as strong at the, at the greater depth um, than in the, in the siliceous parent material. Concerning porosity, it's similar as we have a very pronounced trend, especially here for the, for the um, most shallow depth, 10 centimeters. Just another example, sand content and silt content. And here, if we again, just compare slightly, we jump, what jumps out is the, for the green boxes, again, the most shallow layers um, in the old moraines, a really reduced sand content. Um, and then on the other side, on the right-hand side, the increased silt content. So we really have a strong uh, movement towards the finer, um, fractions here, and this seems to be happening again top down, so at the deepest horizon, 50 centimeters, we don't see this as much yet. So again, Katya did out, did all these brilliant blue dye experiments, and now you here see here examples of the, of the soil profiles. Um, we basically have the same similar soil types, leptosols for the uh, young ones and camisols for the old ones. And then this, um, what you saw before in the siliceous parent material, more of a podzole that we have at the oldest moraine, which we did not find in the calcareous parent material. Okay, so if we now move on st straight to the flow types, we see that um, the left-hand plot is the uh, siliceous uh, parent material, which you saw before. Right hand side, uh, the new site, calcareous. Again, same color coding as before. The homogeneous matrix flow is the dark blue. We see a similar trend um, with age, with re reduced matrix flow with age at both moraines. And we also see um, that the preferential flow factions increase with age, also at this. Uh, at the second um, geology. But here we don't have this big fraction of macropore flow with low interaction. This is something we do not observe here. And we also observe a lot more deeper flow in the calcareous uh, parent material also at the old moraine where it stopped uh, basically apart from these few macropores it stopped in the uppermost horizons. At the first site, we don't see that here. So it really seems like geology matters. You can't ignore geology. You can't stop at just one geology and then infer other processes in other geologies. Uh, so again, Anna made fancy figures. This is the one for the siliceous parent material, um, trying to you know, get at the the aging and the evolution and so on. And this is a very full figure, I know. I just wanna show you that there is a lot going on, right? And then now we have the second um, geology 
And again, there's a lot going on and it's a kind of, yeah, there are some differences. Of course, pH uh, evolution is very different here because we're in calcareous uh, material. So we have a constant high pH, which also then does not lead to this puzzle um, in the end. But yeah, it's a lot of information to analyze. Um, you can get some sort of story out of this, but we also wanted to take a more quantitative approach again. And for that, um, Anna used some or developed, calculated the preferential flow index, uh, which is the cumulative frequency of all the preferential flow, flow types, these four flow types that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then in, in like just to get an overview, looked at how this preferential flow index um, relates to various controls, various variables. And here we have everything from, so there's, um, I'm sorry, it's just the short forms uh, in, the, in the labels here, but on the left-hand side, there's a little um, uh, legend. Um, so you can see that there is, yeah, preferential flow is controlled by various variables, but there's also a lot of uh, cross-correlation going on which makes it really difficult to use something like um, statistical models in this case. And so um, we've been trying out many different approaches to, to get to how we can you know, better understand what the main controls are, or are there clusters here, or how can we, we get to this? And so one thing that Anna did was um, use a cluster analysis. So um, random forests, and proximity analysis, analysis, and you see the uh, the first results of that here. So this is something we're currently still working on, and I'm really thankful if you have any ideas here or suggestions on how to go about this. So on the left hand side, you see the cluster dendrogram uh, of for with as input we only use the soil properties of the top ten centimeters because here we want to look at what effect does near surface or surface um, characteristics have on the generation of preferential flow. And so what you see is on the one side is like the clusters that we identified. And then you see these little pie charts and the black fraction of the pie chart shows a fraction of preferential flow. Um, so this is just a cluster analysis. So we're not putting in preferential flow here, but just the soil properties. And you see how the clusters, we have two main clusters um, that develop, which put all the younger moraines on the left side and then all the older moraines. So CPM is a calcareous parent material, SPM is siliceous parent material, and then you have the age. Um, so again, green is you know, the color coding that we use throughout here. You also see it here. So, all the old moraines show up here in the cluster on the right. But then we also see that just by using the soil properties of the top 10 centimeters, we get two clusters and they are defined by the geology. So again, we see geology matters. We should not ignore geology because it really leads to differences. Um, the younger moraines are mixed a bit more um, in terms of geology, but we also see that the youngest all show up here apart from this one. And then the 160 of both geology show up on this side. So this second cluster. Um, but the difference is because this uh, separation comes higher, um, the differences between these two clusters are bigger than the differences between these two clusters. But then we also used surface or vegetation characteristics um, because also here, this can have an effect on preferential flow generation. And now suddenly, again, we see uh, similar clusters for the old uh, moraines, uh, very differentiated by geology. Um, and then we also, but of course, yeah, then you can go into more detail here, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Um, we also see that now uh, we actually see three clusters with the two um, delicious um, moraines in two separate clusters, and then the three 160-year-old moraine uh, plots 
um, of the calcareous material in a third cluster. So here now, again, differentiated by geology and then also by age on the side. And you can see that this, mainly the age component, but also in part geology, has um, the effect on preferential flow. So there is a connection between these identified clusters and the preferential flow index. So to um, move to some fun facts of field seasons one, uh, just for a bit of uh, fun before I move on to our conclusions, um, some facts. We installed 19 cubic meter of equipment and material. On the hill slopes, the PhD students and technicians spent a lot of time. They basically spent all summer there. Um, so these added up to 5,050 person hours. The geobotanists identified 167 dif uh, different plants. Three, 30,000 liters of water were pumped. 550 meters of hose were installed. The number of times that the hoses burst was larger than 10, but fortunately the number of hose explosions was only one. The number of hours we accidentally shut down the water supply of the nearby and fully booked alpine centers, seven, seven hours, our fault. Number of times we almost got arrested, one, luckily only one. Um, number of times an expedition member had to rush off because his baby was being born, one. So this is what it looked like when we took down all the equipment at the end of the field season. So as you can see, it really is a lot of stuff and a lot of work. What I didn't talk about in this presentation <coughs> is that we also used deuterium for tracing the water movement through the soil. Um, we also looked at, excuse me, weathering and biogeochemistry. No time to talk about that. Conclusions. A lot of change already happens in the first 160 years. So especially we saw this um, at the silicious parent material because we had this nice first young moraine at 30 years. So we saw how much happened there. We saw that geology matters and the differences between the geologies become stronger with age. Generally, we found pronounced changes in form, soil physics, vegetation, but also pronounced changes in flow path and water storage, which is function. So what, you might say, um, why is this important? I mean, it's kind of interesting and it seems fun, a lot of field work, but why is this important? Well, we are expecting a lot of glacial retreat in the coming years. We need to know that these areas are hotspots of sediment transport, export of total dissolved solids, carbonate weathering. Also, a lot of our landscapes um, have been formed during the last glaciation and are 10,000 years old. Um, so Scandinavia, 7,000 to 9,000 years old. Knowing their trajectory improves our process understanding. We also need to know these sorts of things for the interpretation of sediment cores. Climate reconstruction often of these sediments cores often or almost always neglects the impact of hydrological changes on the sediment records. So um, <laughs> understanding how hill slope structure, hill slope form evolves and how this affect and is affected by, because it's again, this feedback circle, vegetation and hydrological and biogeochemical -ge cycles, the hill slope function is really important for managing hill slopes sustainably, including newly developed hill slopes, such as those created after mining and for the effective restoration of degraded hill slopes. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, for movies and updates, you can look at our websites. And I'm open for any questions or suggestions. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Teresa. Wow. What an incredible experiment. And I think what's most incredible, you cleaned up afterwards. If you go to My My or Panola, <laughs> it's all still there. It's like a it's like base camp at uh, in Nepal, you know. At, at, uh, it's 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 not good. So you've you've done you've done great work. Uh, also, yeah, in cleanup, I mean, that so. was essential. We wouldn't have gotten permission, <laughs> right, uh, to work in these sensitive areas if we hadn't promised that we would leave everything 
of course pretty much yeah. as we had found it um yeah so yeah. uh we're, we we don't have much time but uh i i will look for hands up or a question into the chat or just unmute yourself and chime in if you have a question for Teresa. And maybe while we wait, maybe for someone to chime in, you know, if we think of process description of a place like that generally, not a hill slope, but maybe the catchment those hill slopes are in, we think variable source area concept, you know, that's kind of a overarching conceptual framework for thinking about how, how landscapes activate. I'm just wondering your thoughts on that for that landscape. Is that a useful framework? Is it not useful? Uh, do we need to move beyond that based on your thinking and those kinds of, uh, you know, recently glaciated valleys? And again, I'm looking for questions in the chat. Well, yeah. as, as Teresa maybe reflects on that. Thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, for this concept, I mean, this is a super challenging area then because of this super high variability in, yeah. in structures and the development, right? So this is not really what we looked at here. Yeah. Um, but of course, I mean, as you saw this, how it changes with mm -hmm. like the surface connectivity changed and the and the and the um transport changed so you in this case it's not just about um you know looking at the topography or like how ever you would else infer uh, your variable yeah. source areas you have to really look at the age too because that matters so much in these environments yeah uh, yeah good thanks here, here's a question from Magali. She's in an airport on route ah. home, so she's put it into the chat. Uh, Teresa, thanks for your talk. I appreciate all the hard field work. Could you talk a bit more about the dive results on the moraines? Let me try to read it here. Uh, what happened with the dye in the old moraine that is also highly vegetated and you observed lots of unstained soil? Would you attribute the unstained soil mainly to the presence of more preferential flow paths that are driving infiltration to deeper soil layers and bypassing the matrix? Or do you think the vegetation intercepted it or took up the irrigated water? Any thoughts on that? Okay, good question. <laughs> um, so at this oldest moraine, we had this um, quite thick organic layer. And this layer, so soil layer, this layer actually stored a lot of the water. Um, so, it, um, it was very um, porous, uh, high porosity, so it stored a lot of the water. And then, as you said, we had these preferential flow paths going to greater depth, and these were macropore flow paths, and they channeled the water to greater depth. And so then we basically, in the mineral soil, we, we hardly had any matrix flow at all. So it's not so much about the uptake of the um, plants that stopped um, infiltration in this case but the storage of this organic layer um, uptake i mean these soils are pretty wet because we're high up in the mountains um, there's a lot of rain um, so it's not like the uptake really mattered that much and also um, i mean the irrigation was carried out one afternoon and the next morning it was dug up so here i don't think this this has that much of an effect yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a follow-up question by John Gazelle. Any thoughts about plant root water uptake uh, influencing the experiment? But I, I think you've you've covered that. Um, we're just after the hour, and I know uh, most of the participants will join us for the hour. So what I think we'll do, Teresa, if it's okay with you, we'll end this formal presentation. And thank you so much again. That is the uh, is really an incredible and inspiring uh, experiment with such a stellar team. So thanks so much for that. And then for those early career folks that want to stay on for a short early career discussion, uh, Teresa. So maybe I can briefly, just before people leave, yeah. Yeah. if you have questions or suggestions on how to further analyze this big data set, just yeah. please get in touch. Um, you can get my email through Jeff, or if you just Google Teresa Blume, you will find me. Yeah. 
Very good. Okay, thanks very much. We'll do that.